forum. I'd like to start the next session by sharing three figures that I've read about recently. One is one out of nine. The second is one third, and the final is 52 billion. Did you know that one out of nine people in the world do not have enough food to live an active and a healthy life? If this auditorium was the whole world, it would be like one whole continent was perpetually hungry. For my second figure, exasperatingly and ironically, one third of all of our food globally is thrown away. That's like if you have a refrigerator with three shelves, each of them stocked full of food, and one of you you take out and you throw them away before anybody ever touches it. And the last figure of 52 billion. Can anyone guess? Did you know that there are almost 52 billion chickens in the world? 52 billion chickens. That's almost 10 per person. And there's some six billion cows. With so many chickens and cows in the world, with so much food thrown away, how can we still have so many hungry people in the world? Our next session, we're going to have a conversation that's going to focus specifically on that issue. And I would like to invite to the stage Anne Walker Marchand, CEO of the Walker Marchand Group. And Erthrin Cousin, the World Food Program's executive director, a trailblazer in the fight against hunger. So I give the floor to you. Thank you. Welcome, Erthrin. Excuse my voice; I've got a little bit of a cold, but there was no way I was going to miss the opportunity to interview somebody who is really a trailblazer. And I'm fortunate enough to be able to call her a dear friend. We've worked together. We've been friends. We've supported each other over many, many years. And she is now the executive director of the World Food Program, tackling the issues of the world, all over the world.、Um, and I invited her to come to the world, to, to the Women's Forum, for many, many years. It's always been a challenge because of her travel schedule, but also it happens during World Food Day, which is tomorrow. But The fact that she's here today, and our theme of our session is leading for a more innovative、um, approach to—I'm sorry, <laughs> I just lost. Leading for a more innovative approach、um, to solving the world's issues. I can't think of a better person to have here. So, Erthrin, I want to first start out by showing a little video、um, about what Erthrin does in the World Food Program.
as you can see, Earth Erin is on the front lines of leading for a more equitable world. And when you see this video, it can be overwhelming, it can be daunting, it can be challenging. How do you approach every day when the, the needs are so great? Well, thank you, Anne, very much for that question. And thank you all for the opportunity to spend time with you here this afternoon. When I watch videos like that, it, first of all, is very emotional because these are real people and real lives, but it's never overwhelming because the world can't afford for me, of all people, to be overwhelmed. I have 14,000 people who work for me in some of the toughest places around the world. And my responsibility is to ensure that I have conversations with people like you in this room, to ensure that we build the public will that is necessary so that we can address the challenges of hunger, particularly the acute challenges of hunger that are stopping us from actually achieving a zero hunger world. I think some people might not understand exactly what types of challenges and what types of resources are needed to do what you do. I was surprised to know that you have the largest fleet of planes and pilots in the world, that you, World Food Program, operates all of the United Nations resources around flight and transportation. So your distribution networks are enormous, your ability to get to people is great. But talk to us about some of the challenges that we might not associate with hunger. Well, when people think about crisis, they think about security. They don't often think about hunger. But whenever there is a crisis, there is lack of availability and too often lack of access to food. For example, today in Syria, where we know that this conflict has now lasted three years, going into four years, we have three, bil three million people who have taken refuge in the countries around Syria, and we are working to feed them every single day. Inside Syria, more than six and a half million people are internally displaced, which means that they've moved from their home, some of them one, two, three times. And with the increased threat of ISIS now, we are having ever more challenges actually accessing people inside Syria who have needs. And our fear and what we fight against is our inability to access those populations when ISIS has access to food means that they may be feeding them. And we know that to a mother who can't feed her child, to a father who can't feed their child, the piece of, a piece of bread is the face of God and they don't care who they get it from. And so if we want to ensure security, we must ensure that we're meeting the food needs of those who are the victims in, all, in every crisis, wherever they are, and whatever is the source of that crisis or challenge. Thank you. Can you also talk a little bit about what you're going to do day after tomorrow? I know you're on your way to Ghana. You're always on your way someplace. Earthrin travels more than anybody that I know. She's on the forefront and in the lines of battle and duty 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it doesn't matter where. So she's leaving here tonight to go back to Rome, where she's based, um, to celebrate World Food Day tomorrow, and then on her way tomorrow night to Ghana to deal with health issues, issues that people would think of as World Health Organization issues, but yet you're there. Well, we are, I leave here, as Ann just noted, going back to commemorate the challenges of addressing food insecurity around the world and chronic malnutrition. We can't forget that 165 million children are chronically malnourished. And so you cannot address food security and not address the issues of malnutrition simultaneously. So I leave there tomorrow night at 10 o'clock and I'll sleep on yet another airplane as I fly to Accra where we're meeting with all of the other UN agencies because the UN has stood up what we call UNMIR, which is the UN's response to the Ebola crisis because there's a recognition that this is not just a health crisis. It's a food crisis. It's a lack of access to support crisis. So it's going to, in order for us to combat the health challenges, we must also ensure that people have access to food, clean water, shelter. You cannot tell people we want to isolate you and not meet their needs. So right now we're working to scale up to feed a million people in the, the three affected countries, but also 
we're working because we, as Ann noted, we are also the logistics lead for the humanitarian community. And so that means that we run the humanitarian air service. We have the trucks, the, the boats, the, the cargo carriers, whatever is required. If we don't own it, we lease it to ensure that we can get the tools that re allow us to reach people, no matter where they are, in the most remote locations. And that's what we're doing right now. We're also working with the World Health Organization, UNICEF, DPO, to build the treatment centers, not just the, the emergency treatment centers in cities, but the ever more important centers, the community care centers, out in those tough areas, so people don't need to carry their family members miles in order to find treatment. And they don't need to hide their family members because they're afraid that they won't get treatment. So we are providing the food, but also providing the support so that we can achieve what we're now calling 60, 70, 70. In 60 days, 70% of the people who are infected receive quality care, and 70% of the people who lose their lives have honor honorable and safe burials. It doesn't seem like a lot, but when a crisis is doubling, the number of cases is doubling every 21 days, it means that we must invest and invest fast in, in performing the work that's necessary to stem this disease. So that's what I'll do in about 48 hours when I leave here. Um, but it, we go from there and I fly from there to Doha in hopes of attracting more resources. So I go wherever is need to, I need to go because the 14,000 people who work for me are right there on the ground and I need to ensure that they have the resources that are necessary to meet the needs of the almost 100 million people that we serve every year. Can you tell me a little bit about what we talked about last night, which was ensuring that in your senior ranks within the World Food Program that you have representation of women, that you have representation of those that have not been represented previously, have not had a voice? Well, I've had, a, I've had a lot of great women in my life who've ensured that I've had opportunities. And even when they didn't think a little African-American girl from the west side of the city of Chicago should have those opportunities. So I make sure that now that I'm in this role, that I provide opportunities for other women. WFP, when Catherine Bertini, who was the, in my post some 10 odd years ago, she drove the organization to 40% women in all of our particularly senior posts. And we've been at 40% since then. I have been executive director for the last two and a half years and 50% of all the promotions that I've signed off on have been women because I am committed that when I leave there, we will have made significant progress towards achieving parity of women because we know that when women lead, we make progress. Not because we are better, but because we leave behind half the talent if we don't bring women along into the leadership roles. Does hunger affect men and women differently? Do you see that in the field? Do you see that in the regions and cultures that you're dealing with? Unfortunately, yes. We see it because we often say women eat last. The first thing a woman does, as you all know, is they make sure their children can eat. And then in most societies, they feed their husbands. And then if there's something left, women eat. And in too many places where we work around the world, women, don't, women often don't even eat at the same table with their children, let alone their husbands. And so ensuring one of the things that we do with our programs, particularly in emergency situations, is ensure that women have access to the food, that they are the decision makers, that we have programs that empower women, but also protect them. And that way we know that women will eat but also their children, and yeah, they'll feed their husbands too. But we also, because we know, when we talk about chronic malnutrition we, and ending stunting, if women aren't healthy, babies aren't healthy, families aren't healthy. 
So while women may think they're making a sacrifice, they're detrimentally impacting the future of their family if they're not receiving the micronutrients that are necessary for them to ensure the health of their children and their family. So we provide the education also to women that help them understand why it's just as important for them to eat as it is for their husbands to eat. I know this is gonna be a tough question because there are probably a lot of things that keep you up at night, but depending on what time zone it is and you sit up in bed at three o'clock in the morning because something's concerning you, what is that likely to be? Oh, Mia. The thing that usually keeps me up at night is not having enough money. WFP is 100% voluntarily funded, and we are always underfunded because most of the, and 95% of the money that we receive comes from governments, and governments target where they want that money to go. And too often that targeting goes to what's in the news right now. And for example, during the Haiti earthquake, we received significant contributions to support the people who were the victims and impacted by Haiti. But two years later, we were forced to cut our school feeding program by 50% because we didn't have enough money. We were forced to cut our women and children's nutrition program by 50% because we didn't have enough money. In the last month, I've been on television wherever anybody would have me talking about the fact that we were going to need to cut rations to the Syrians who were the victims of this ongoing conflict because we didn't have enough money for the vouchers that would that give them the ability to buy the food that's necessary for October, November, and December. And thank goodness some of the donors have stepped up and we had enough money for, no, for October and we didn't, weren't forced to cut rations. Now I'm still out there passing that 10 cup again because we don't have enough money for November and December. The one thing that a person who is fleeing with their children for safety should not have to worry about is whether or not that child is going to eat. And so, yeah, it keeps me up at night trying to make sure that we don't ever prioritize one hungry child over another and that we provide the assistance that's required to all the hungry children in the world. You've been doing a lot with private-public partnerships, with corporations who have stepped in and signed partnerships with the World Food Program. I know that you've just signed a partnership with one of the sponsors here, Sodexo, and also with Nissan. Can you tell us what you think the role of corporations are in this the reality is, if we truly are going to embrace and achieve the goal of ending hunger and achieving zero hunger, sustainable and durable, hunger-free world in our lifetimes, no one organization alone is going to do it. The UN can't do it alone. It will take all of us, every single one of us, including the private sector to support the investments that are necessary to ensure that we can provide the multi-year, multilateral investment in the tools that will ensure that ultimately people can feed themselves, that ultimately people have access to food, nutritious food all year round. And private sector is beginning to embrace that opportunity. Historically, WFP, like most UN organizations, depended completely on government contributions. But you have organizations like UNICEF, for example, where they have for years had access to private sector resources. In with my predecessor, she started a very successful pilot that got private sector involved in the work of WFP. And we brought on BCG as a partner who now contributes six significant consulting work to WFP, not just dollars. We couldn't do the innovative work that we do today if I didn't have BCG staff seconded to WFP. We couldn't do the work that we do today if I didn't have partners like Unilever and DSM who were bringing all of their patented products to assist us in achieving and delivering outcomes. And so we're really proud of every one of the corporate partners who have stepped up and raised their hand and said, I've got a little money because we always need money, but I also have people, tools, ideas that can help us all in work together to end hunger. So if any of you are in here and want to partner with WFP, we're open for business. Thank you.
you mentioned that you're an African American young girl growing up in the west side of on the west side of Chicago, and you face challenges just as we all face challenges, but you've overcome challenges and you've pursued your passion, or should we call it a calling? Um, tell us a little bit about what gave you the courage to do what you do, to get where you are. Well, when you talk about me growing up on the west side of the city of Chicago, there have been articles that say I grew up poor. My mother hates those stories, so please don't anybody print that I grew up poor. I grew up in a poorer neighborhood, but my mother reminds me I had two parents who worked every day, put food on the table, and we were better off than a lot of people in the neighborhood, so don't write that I was poor, first. <laughs> Second, I grew up visioning the possibilities of helping change the world, of changing the world. I wanted, when I was a kid, I shared this with you, and I wanted to be a doctor, a nurse, and a teacher. And my mother and father never said that's ridiculous. They said, okay, that's interesting, do that. You also wanted to be a director and a producer. <laughs> and, and I did want to be an seals. actress, and I then directed plays, and they said, that's a good idea, do that. And they embraced every possibility. If I could envision it, they embraced it. And so that's what we need to give to our girls, is the spirit that they can do anything. And but they went a step further. They would, my father would take us on rides outside of our neighborhood all the time so we could see where other people pe lived in different communities who had larger houses, who had more. And my sisters and I would always say, that's my house, that's my house, that's my house. But they also gave us a sense of responsibility. So we didn't have a ceiling on our dreams. And we knew that there was a possibility of doing anything else. But I was also a little odd, I was a different, and so I will admit that. And when I was 10 years old, and many of you who are from the States may remember during the 1960s when we had the riots in urban America, I lived in a community that one night was on fire. But what was I doing during that period? I was working to save the baby seals. I had written a petition because I had seen seals battered and skinned, and I was knocking on the doors of my neighbors saying, please sign my petition to save the baby seals. They thought it was a bit odd, but everybody signed the petition. And I sent the petition to the President of the United States, and he wrote me back. <laughs> and he said that he agreed we needed to save the baby seals. And so, so here I am, a 10-year-old, being a, with an article in a, in a national magazine, because I was working to save the baby seals. It wasn't impossible. And so when you are that young and you are supported in doing what others might think impossible, who am I at 50 blah 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 <laughs> to think that ending hunger in our lifetime is impossible? We can do it. You, you mentioned that you had a safety net which allowed you to take risk at a very early age, that you had a support system and a safety net. Yes, when I was young, I had a support system of a family who, as you heard me say, they supported whatever it was, not just me, but my sisters as well. Whatever it was that we wanted to do, they gave us the support, go do that, we'll be here. And so you knew that no matter what you did, if you fell, you wouldn't fall too far. And then as I got older, in addition to having my sisters, I also had a safety net of girlfriends. And I say this to young people all the time. If you don't have a group of girlfriends who hold you up, get one. Get a group. Because there are lots of times when you need to walk into a room and be the duck. You just glide across the water where you're paddling, paddling, paddling underneath the water. And nobody knows you're paddling like that except your girlfriends. And they say, paddle on, girlfriend, we're here for you. You know you can't go into a meeting and cry, but the girlfriends will drink that glass of wine with you afterwards and let you cry and, and, and vent. So you need that. And it's, Madeline Albright once said, there's a special place in hell for women who don't help other women. <laughs> and I live by that.
So as we send you off to do all of the, the work that you will be doing over the next few days and next few weeks, I think I'd like to, on behalf of the Women's Forum, say thank you and paddle on, girlfriend. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And